Hello and welcome to another edition of Mr. Lash's Digital Classroom. This lecture is going to be on the Tudor state. In 1939, when the British were under attack from the Germans at the beginning of World War II, they created a number of propaganda campaigns to help boost morale. One of the more famous campaigns is the ubiquitous Keep Calm and Carry On. And at the top of the propaganda posters was the Tudor crown, a well-known symbol of authority within British society at the time. What this lecture is going to address is how the Tudors went from being just another dynasty to literally symbolizing authority to the British people. Now, the Tudors came to power in 1485 with the defeat of Richard III by Henry VII. Henry VII is kind of an interesting guy. He was fiscally conservative. And when I mean fiscally conservative, I meant that this was the type of guy who every night before he went to bed would make sure that his checkbook was balanced. He would literally make sure that the state's money was all accounted for before he went to bed. He made sure that people were collecting taxes and, that, and those tax dollars were going to him so that he could redistribute them as he see fit. Now, he was also very concerned about foreign policy. He was not as concerned with the position of England in France if England at home was going to be weak. So he purposefully gave up foreign territories with the hope of strengthening England's core. To that end, he would have lavish parties at court in London because he wanted to have the nobility come to him. And along with that idea of strength, he named his eldest son Arthur with a conscious nod to the Arthurian legend. King Arthur and Merlin and Excalibur and all that stuff. He named his eldest son Arthur. His second son he named Henry because, well, Henry's such a great name for a king. And it's going to be under Henry because Arthur will die young. It's going to be up to Henry to create the Tudor state, to create Tudor authority. And he's going to do it in two ways. The first is going to be through the Reformation, and the second is going to be through a Tudor revolution in government. Hmm. Now, the first thing you need to know about the English Reformation was that it was distinctly English. Unlike the Lutheran or Calvinist movements on continental Europe, which began with theologians and then was later taken up by the state, the English Reformation began with the state and then spread to the rest of the kingdom. It was Henry VIII who started the English Reformation. Now, Henry wasn't always anti-Catholic. In, in fact, he was given an award by the Pope uh, for being a defender of the faith, for writing a treatise against the Lutherans. So what happened to make Henry so anti-Pope? Well, he's going to have some marital problems. And the problem isn't with the women he married. Uh, in fact, many of these women were extraordinary for their time. Um, very well educated, opinionated, able to understand the complexities of government that Henry faced. But they weren't able to give him sons. And for an early modern king, nothing matters more than having sons. So, he had a son, in fact, one son, but he was an illegitimate son. A son that he had out of marriage, and therefore, it would be inappropriate for the son to take the throne. Uh, Henry Fitzroy. Fitzroy literally meaning son of the king. So, he needed lawful sons. Because lawful sons meant peaceful dynasties. When the king died, your eldest son took over the throne. If that eldest son died without any sons, then your next eldest son would take over the throne. There are no sons, and all of a sudden there's an argument over, well, can daughters take the throne, or is it going to go back to some second or third cousin, or, God forbid, a Frenchman could somehow end up on the throne of England. All of these things were concerns that Henry had. So if Henry wanted a stable marriage, he had to get an annulment for his marriage with Catherine of Aragon. The problem is that Catherine of Aragon was first daughter of the King of Spain, and although that king had died, she was now aunt to the current King of Spain. Now, he gave, or rather, she gave Henry a daughter, but no sons. As I said before, that was a problem. Typically, the Pope would give an annulment in these sorts of situations because the Pope understands these sorts of issues. You know, king wants a stable kingdom. It benefits the Pope and the Catholic Church to have stable kingdoms. So in situations like this, it wasn't uncommon for the Pope to simply say, all right, you're right, you can have an annulment. But because of the influence of the King of Spain, and specifically the wealth of the King of Spain, and the army 
that the king of Spain had, and all this links back to the New World um, and the wealth that they are bringing up from there, the Pope refused, putting Henry in a very difficult position. Henry is going to break with the church, not out of any theological difference. He actually liked the teachings and orthodoxy of the Catholic Church. But he needs to have a divorce. For him, the stability of his kingdom comes first. So he will divorce Catherine, and he will divorce the church. Now, as I talked about in my last lecture, this is a period where the government is going to rely more and more on bureaucrats. And Henry VIII's bureaucrats, prior to the Reformation, were reading about Luther in secret. And now that Henry had openly broken with the church, now these men were openly implementing Luther's ideas in England. And once he's broken from the church, and no longer tied to the church, he's going to be able to obviously divorce Catherine and marry his second wife, Anne Boleyn, who we have a portrait of up on the screen. Now, Anne is going to be executed based on trumped-up charges of infidelity and treason, which most historians consider to be false. And after, going, after the death of Anne, he will go through four more wives. However, he will only have three children. So he'll be married six times, but only have three children. Those three children will come from his first three wives. Catherine of Aragon will give him Mary. Anne Boleyn will give him Elizabeth. And Jane Seymour will give him Edward. All three of his children will one day sit on the throne of England. And they're all going to interpret or react to the Reformation in very different ways. Edward will take the throne as a child. So those advisors are going to implement a very radical version of Protestantism in England. However, Edward is very sickly and dies very young. So when Mary comes to the throne, a woman comes to the throne, she's going to reverse all of those reforms and actually bring England back into the Catholic Church. However, she's going to die. And she will be replaced by her younger sister, Elizabeth, the daughter of Anne Boleyn. Elizabeth is going to establish a very moderate Protestantism. Um, so moderate, in fact, that she will very famously say that she is not concerned about creating windows into men's souls. She's not concerned about what religion you practice or believe in, provided the, that you don't actively work against her politics. So you can be a closet Catholic, in her opinion, as long as that Catholicism does not force you to be a treasonous subject, a rebellious subject, a bad subject. Now, all these changes in religion, none of them would have happened if not for the concurrent changes in government, what some historians have called a revolution in government. Now, this revolution was not so much a change in, in, in the government itself. When we think of revolutions today, we think of you know, one group of people being forcibly removed from government and a new, new people taking over, and those new people bringing in new uh, ideas about the government, how that government should, should act. That's not going to happen here. What instead this revolution is, is a revolution in how people thought about government. And one of the major changes is that authority is no longer going to be based on the man, but on the office. And what I mean by that is that today, when you see a police officer, you're respectful of that police officer because of the office he has. He's an officer of the law. Right? During the medieval period, you would respect a, a justice of the peace. Partly because he was an officer of the law, but mostly because he was a big, strong guy carrying a sword. And if you disobeyed him, he could hurt you. Right? Authority came from the man, not the office. During the early modern period, during this revolution in government, authority is going to come from the office. Along with this change, is going to, you're going to get the rise of professionals. People whose job it is to run court. Right? People whose job it is to make laws and interpret the laws and collect taxes and count money and advise the king. All right? And they're going to replace pow powerful um, courtiers or powerful noblemen who would often reside at court and influence the king. With the creation of these professional bureaucrats and the emphasis on authority coming from the office, we're also going to see standard practices for the government. Right? The way in which offices are supposed to be run are going to be standardized. 
the Secretary of the Exchequer is going to have certain rights and responsibilities that he's going to have to perform. A Justice of the Peace is going to have certain rights and responsibilities that he's going to have to perform, and there are going to be limits on that authority as well. So while Henry's children might have disagreed on the English Reformation and religion and everything else, they're all going to benefit from the strong central government that was established under Henry VIII. But was this authority equally enforced? Now, obviously, authority was strongest around the capital, London. That's where the king lived. That's where most of his strongest supporters were. That's where his armies tended to be and his bodyguards tended to be. But what about the frontiers? What about West, near Wales and in Wales? What about on the North, on the border of Scotland? And what about Ireland in general? In these territories, you had powerful noblemen who had armies of their own because they had enemies to fight. In Ireland, you had to fight the Irish. In, Scot in the north, you had to fight the Scottish. Um, and in the west, in and around Wales, you had to fight the Welsh. So these men obviously had large armies, trained and experienced, that had to be brought to order. Right? That had to be brought under stricter control of the English government. So the way that they're going to do this is that the English crown is going to go after not just those English noblemen on the frontiers, but the Welsh the Northerners, the Irish. And they're going to bring them in in a combination of ways. First, they're going to offer them titles of nobility or government office. They're going to say, look, you're used to doing things your way. We get it. But how about we give you title, we give you money, we give you land, and you do things our way. The other thing that they're going to do is, for people who refuse to take up their offer, they're simply going to send the army in. In conclusion, the combination of the English Reformation and the Tudor Revolution in government is going to create a much stronger England. The English Reformation is going to separate England from the Catholic Church, and it's going to create a religion based on English values and traditions that was inherently tied to a strong central government. The, that Tudor Revolution in government is going to strengthen government authority and expand that authority throughout the kingdom. All in all, by focusing on internal problems and on internal strength, England is going to become a much stronger state. And in the long term, what that means is that England is going to be able to expand itself beyond. This is what's going to set the stage for the English Empire, the British Empire. 